invite you to join me in reading our call to worship responsibly. You'll find it printed in your worship guide. Come, give to the Lord your praises of thanksgiving. Sing with great enthusiasm of God's mighty power and love. We celebrate God's love that our hearts. It is good to give thanks and praise to God. May God's praise always be in our hearts and in our lives. Good morning and welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church on this summer Sunday in July. We're glad each of you is here. Uh, we're especially glad that you're here if you are our guest this morning. If this is your first time here at Central. We would love to invite you to do one thing for us while you're here. I hope you'll take a Welcome to Central card from the pew rack in front of you. Take just a moment to fill it out with some basic information about yourself and then drop that completed card in the offering plate as it comes by later in the worship service. Let that be your offering to us this morning, please. We would love to have a record of your presence today so that we might have an opportunity to reach out more personally to you and share with you some of the things that God is doing in us and through us here at Central Baptist Church. I also want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online or by way of television. We want you to know that we're cognizant of your presence with us too as we gather here in this sanctuary and count you among our congregation. We gather every week at Central because we believe that the shared experience of God in worship in this place and in this hour has the power to transform us. So my prayer for you and my prayer for me as we worship together this morning is that God would use these next few minutes to change our lives.
join with me in the reading of the litany? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he is founded upon the seas and established it on the earth. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from, from the God of their salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your grace, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Lift up your heads, O gates, lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Let me invite our children to join me at the front for our children's sermon, please. See if I can get this guy turned on. There we go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> can anybody in our group this morning tell me who this is? Yes, ma'am. EP320. That's right. EP320 is our alien Martian mascot from Vacation Bible School last week. Many of you around here on the floor in front of me were there with us. Uh, we had uh, nearly a hundred children with us each day last week for Vacation Bible School, and each day of Vacation Bible School, we learned a different Bible story, and each day our Bible story taught us something different about God. Each day we learned that when God is present with us, when God is in our lives, we can always be one of four things. Anybody remember what those things are? When God is with us, we can be faithful. When God is with us, we can be bold. When God is with us, we can be kind. And when God is with us, we can be thankful. That's exactly right. We can be thankful. Each, different, each day, a different Bible story taught us a different thing that we could be when God was present in our lives. And we had an anchor verse, a vector verse, we called it, that we repeated over and over again all week long that I think many of us learned together. And we repeat, uh, I had the children repeat it after me lots and lots and lots of times last week. So I'm going to ask you, many of you already know it, but I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me together for our congregation this morning. So will you please repeat after me? Glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine. Let's say it one more time. Glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine. That's from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, EP 320. Y'all get it? This morning in worship, we are transitioning from learning about the history of the formation of the kingdom of Israel to a study in the book of Ephesians, the very same book uh, that our memory verse from VBS comes from. Except for this morning, instead of reading from Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to read from Ephesians chapter 1. And as we hear God's word read together in the sanctuary today, we are going to learn that when God is with us, we can always be generous. During Vacation Bible School, we learned that when God is with us, we can always be faithful, we can always be bold, we can always be kind, we can always be thankful. And this morning in worship, we're learning that when God is with us, we always have good reason to be generous. Would you guys join me in a prayer? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these children. We're thankful for the opportunity we've had this week uh, to have a wonderful week of ministry and fellowship at Vacation Bible School. Help us as we worship this morning that when you are present with us and when we live according to your plan, we always have good reason to be generous. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh. 
This morning's scripture comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, and it's from the message translation. How blessed is God, and what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the highest places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundation, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we are a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all of mis- our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, He had his eye on us, had designs for us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. It's in Christ that you, once you've heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation, found yourself home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This down payment from God is the first installment on what's coming, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Lord of life, you have breathed into us your joyful Holy Spirit. We have seen and experienced your joyful spirit in the children and the teachers this week in Vacation Bible School. We learned this week to delight in your world and in the vast expanses of space that you've created. We learned to delight in one another, new friends and old. We learned to be grateful for the ways that you guide our lives. We learned to worship and delight in your glory. By your power at work within us, we are able to do more than we can imagine. We pray that the songs, the Bible stories, the arts and crafts, mission activity, and fellowship will be seeds of your truth and love that will grow and grow in these children. May Vacation Bible School be a new beginning, preparing these children for worship, for ministry, and for mission. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom,
join with me in prayer? Lord, let us be truly grateful for the generosity we have received from you, our gracious Father. We are blessed beyond most imagination. Let us measure not our worth in dollars but by the manner in which we treat those who can seemingly do little for us. For to whom much is given, much will be required. Thank you, God, for our blessings. Amen.
Thank you. Some stories are better when you know how they end from the very beginning. Some stories at least make much more sense if you know the ending first. And other stories, though, the ending is kind of preordained. You, you know that it's coming right from the beginning of the story. Think about Cinderella, for example. Cinderella is going to marry Prince Charming from the very, very beginning of the story. Snow White, the same thing, right? Uh, the Mighty Ducks are going to win the championship. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Daniel's going to beat Johnny in the All-Valley Karate Championship. You know that's going to happen. Karate Kid, right? The question isn't whether or if, but how. We know how these stories are going to end from the very beginning. And the interest, the excitement in the story, the suspense, it all comes from the twists and turns along the way to see how we get to a preordained and well-known ending. In other stories, it's the ending that is a complete surprise. There's a, a great twist at the end. You're not quite sure what's happening throughout the story. Everything maybe doesn't make perfect sense as it goes along. But then when you finally know how the story ends, all of the questions you had along the way get answered. All of the pieces that were kind of sitting out there loosely fall into place. And you understand at the end that there was a plan for how this story was constructed all along. And, and you're just kind of blown away by how it all fits together. Whenever I think about a story like this, I think about the movie The Sixth Sense. Some of you will remember that. Uh, Bruce Willis and Haley Joel Osment. Uh, it's a surprise ending that you didn't see coming, but that makes everything fit together so that you know that the story was constructed from the very beginning with the end in mind. Now, it's been long enough since The Sixth Sense was out. Some of you may have forgotten it or never seen it. I won't spoil it for you, but you should just go home and watch it. That's my, my movie recommendation for the morning. Our story with God is, is kind of like The Sixth Sense, the story constructed with everything thought out with the end in mind from the very beginning, more like The Sixth Sense than The Karate Kid. The opening passage of Ephesians points to just that exact truth. Our Christian narrative has enough of a surprise twist at the end. You are being redeemed. That's the surprise at the end of the story. That everything makes much more sense if you can go through the story from the very beginning with the end in mind. And the good news Paul is saying right at the outset of the book of Ephesians is that we can do just that. Paul is saying God has a carefully constructed plan for the entire world and we already know how it ends. And our role, Paul says, in the story become, becomes much more clear if we proceed through the narrative with the end in mind. We've read the first several verses uh, from Ephesians in worship already. Thank you, Josh. But let me invite you to look at the verses on the back of your worship guide just one more time. Here's what Paul is saying. God has a plan for the world. God has always had a plan for the world. And since the foundation of the universe from the very, very beginning, God has had a particular place for you in that plan. And it isn't a secret, Paul says. We know what it is. The goal of God's plan, Paul says, is your redemption. And the center of God's work toward that end is Jesus Christ. That's the gospel in the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 1. Let me read just a little bit of Eugene Peterson's translation right from the center of that passage for you again. God thought of everything. Provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans. He took such delight in making. He set it all out before us. The whole story has been revealed in Christ. A long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in Him. Everything in heaven and everything on earth. This is a, a carefully constructed story, Paul is saying, with a satisfying ending. And it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we had ever even heard of Christ and gotten our hopes up, 
God had God's eye on us. Designs on us for glorious living. That's our part, by the way. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. We are part of a carefully threaded and intricately woven story. One that has been thought out from the very beginning and one that delivers on its promises and does not disappoint. That's what the first chapter of Ephesians says. New Testament scholar Ralph Martin sums it up this way. He says it's a three-part story. God's eternal purpose was established in the beginning through creation. God's purpose was worked out and made clear through Christ's redemptive work in the world. And God's story is made complete in you. That's the surprise. (laughs) That's the exciting part. That's the twist at the end. God's work is made complete in you. Three-part story with Christ at the center and your redemption as the end that God has had in mind from the very beginning. When I was in seminary, I watched every season of the TV show Lost. Some of you might remember watching it too. I had missed the first several seasons. I didn't get clued into Lost right at the very beginning, so I binge-watched the first three seasons just as, as quickly as I could. I actually watched this whole show with my mom, of all people. Like everybody else, we got sucked in right away from the very beginning of this very compelling show. And as the story went along, we together had faith that the creators had a plan in mind for how the story would end. They had a plan from the very beginning about how the story would come to a conclusion that that by the last season, all of the pieces and all of the unanswered questions they were planning out there in the narrative would tidily be brought together, summed up, put into place... (laughs) But they never did. (laughs) They didn't. The creators had no plan for how the show would end at its beginning. And try as they might, the show's creators just couldn't quite pull it all together. And in the end, they left lots of viewers, myself included, more than a little disappointed in the muddled and confusing kind of ending to the show. We've all had experiences like that, I know. Stories or Efforts or relationships or career arcs or family narratives that never deliver on their promise. So we have a tendency to become skeptical or jaded. We can be wary about getting too invested or about setting our hopes too high. But Paul tells us this morning... ...that we know how this story ends. And it doesn't disappoint. God has had a plan in mind from the very beginning... ...and this story delivers. Knowing all of this... ...our job is to play our appropriate role... ...inside God's unfolding narrative. Our job is to live inside God's plan in the way that God intends for us, and our role is pretty straightforward. We are to bring glory and honor to God, that's what Paul says in Ephesians. Glory and honor to God in how we live our lives. That's our role in the carefully constructed play. We do that regularly in worship, of course. We've done it very well already this morning. In song and in prayer and in scripture reading and in litany. Every week, carefully constructed elements of worship designed for that particular purpose, to bring glory and honor to God. And we do it again today. But the Bible tells us over and over again that the best way to bring glory and honor to God is not through our assemblies of worship. It's not through this gathered one hour each week. It isn't through our Sunday morning offerings. It isn't through the well-thought-out rituals of our liturgy. Our truest, best, and most proper form of worship is in how we live our lives the rest of the week. The Old Testament prophets, of course, remind us of this. It isn't lavish ritual sacrifice that God desires from us. It's justice and mercy and humility in our lives out in the world. It's it's generosity. 
James in the New Testament reminds us of this. Religion, pure and undefiled, is what? It's to care for the widows and orphans in their distress. It's to be generous. Paul reminds us of this in Romans. Offer your whole selves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Be generous with your whole self. Be generous. That's our part of the plan. Our whole lives are to be exercises in generosity. That's what brings glory and honor to God. If you've been listening to our sermons this summer, as many of you have, some of you may be saying, Matt, I think I've heard you say this already several times this summer, this bit about being generous. (laughs) And you're right. As we focus on what it means to thrive together as Christians in Noonan, Georgia in the summer of 2021, as we take that question to Scripture week after week after week as we have been, Scripture keeps bringing the same answer back to us. The way we thrive together as Christians here and now, representatives of Christ, is to construct our lives in such a way that we can be living exercises and examples in generosity. Figure out a way to live for others. Back in May, the New York Times published an essay by a young woman named Genevieve Kingston. Genevieve was writing a reflection about her mother. When Genevieve was three years old, her mother learned that she had cancer... And by the time Genevieve was seven, it became apparent that her mother would die. But before her mom died, Genevieve tells us, she threw herself into making gift boxes for each of her children. One for Genevieve and one for Genevieve's brother. Genevieve says she remembers watching her mother spend hours and hours, night after night, alone in the dining room, at the dining room table... The table just littered with ribbons and paper, with cards and bows. She says she received a gift for every birthday from the age of 8 to the age of 30. And a gift for every milestone her mother would miss. Driver's license, high school graduation, a special gift for her first night alone in the dorms. Writing at the age of 30, having carried that that precious box with the carefully wrapped gifts from place to place for 23 years now. Genevieve writes, In the back of my closet is a small cardboard chest with brass handles and latches that has followed me to every new address. It's the first thing I find a place for as the moving truck pulls away. An old sticker on the bottom says it was purchased at Ross for $26.99. And the only remaining contents now are three wrapped presents marked in my mother's tiny cursive. Engagement, wedding, first baby. In the essay, Genevieve remembers glittering rows of neatly wrapped boxes... She remembers opening gifts from birthdays gone by, 12 and 15 and 21. Happy birthday, darling girl, the cards would read, love your mommy. Strand of pearls for her high school graduation. Card that says, I'm sorry I couldn't be here for you today, but these once were mine. She remembers two unexpected occasions for which there were no gifts. The early death of her father. She says she's not sure how she feels about those three unopened gifts remaining in the chest. (laughs) Who knows, she writes, if I'll ever open them. But, she says, I'm not sure I want to. There's comfort, she writes. And knowing there's a little left in the box. 
My mother's gifts, she concludes, her letters, are a constant reminder that I have already been given what every child, what every human needs. I have been fiercely, extravagantly, wildly loved. God's gifts throughout our lives are never ending. Their purpose is our redemption through a constant and growing awareness of God's love for us. And there is comfort in knowing that there's always a little more left in the box. Poet Mary Oliver famously asks, What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? What's the plan, she asks. <laughs> Our part in God's plan is clear. A praising and glorious life, a life of worship demonstrated through constant generosity. As those who have been fiercely, extravagantly, and wildly loved. We construct our lives in such a way that we can be fiercely, extravagantly, and wildly loving ourselves. That's our true and proper worship. As we remember with Paul and the Ephesians, that everything is going according to plan. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we gather today remembering our roles inside your unfolding narrative. And we gather this morning with grateful hearts that as we consider our roles, we know how your story and ours ends. As we are those who are recipients of your wild and continually unfolding love. Make us islands, seas of generosity in the worlds in which you have placed us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We don't end services at Central without giving you an opportunity to respond to what God might be doing in your life or in your heart. There's a way you would respond publicly this morning. Maybe by saying that this is the place me and my family want to call home. We want to plant our roots right here at Central Baptist Church and be an official part as members of what God is doing among these people and in this place. I'd invite you to make that decision this morning. Or maybe this is the morning when you say for the very first time, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my heart. I understand God's role in my unfolding narrative. I'd love for you to make that decision publicly as well. You can do either of those things by meeting me at the front of our sanctuary as we sing our departing hymn together. Let me make you aware of three things before we leave this morning. Number one, church member Terry Allen passed away last week. Uh, we'll help hold a service in her memory and celebrating her life right here in our sanctuary on Tuesday at 11 a.m. Please remember Chester Allen and the extended family in your prayers this week. Number two, two weeks from now is our church anniversary. I think, if I'm counting right, 124 years right here at this corner. We'll celebrate that church anniversary on Sunday morning in worship. And we'll celebrate it together again with a summer church-wide social on Sunday evening hosted by Bill and Anita Headley. I hope you'll put that day on your calendar. Plan to be here with us in the morning for worship and again in the afternoon 
as we just have fun and fellowship together out in our community. Number three, the First Baptist Church of Christ in Macon, led by Reverend Kelsey Stillwell, has been here all weekend uh, teaching us what it means to live lives characterized by generosity, uh, giving their time uh, to do disaster relief and cleanup work right here in Noonan, Georgia. We are grateful for the work you have done in our community and even more grateful for the partnership between our churches that brings you here. Thank you very much for being present with us today. Thank you all of you for being present with us in worship this morning and lead us in our benediction. And now share in this benediction. Now we go out to share God's love with others by the way we live, with the words on our lips, by the generosity of our hands, with the prayers in our minds, and through the love in our hearts. May the grace of Christ redeem you, the love of God support you, and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. Thank you.